plan because God's plan for the Jews was to be part of that great treasure that uh, God created in the garden. I mean, in Eden, in the beginning, in Genesis 2. Verse 7 says, For he that is dead is free from sin. What happened to me when I got saved in 1986, the things that I did became, uh, you know, an offense to me. I mean, I would hear myself using foul language and it become an offense to me. It come, it, 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 it bore into me that, that, you know, that convicting power, you know, of, of my new being, the created in the image of Christ. Verse 8 says, Now if we be dead with Christ, we believe that we shall also live with him. That's my plan. Verse 9 says, Knowing that Christ, being raised from the dead, dieth no more. Once you're dead, you ain't going to die no more. That's what Jesus told Martha and Mary in John 11. That's what uh, Jesus told them. If you believe in me, you shall never die, but live. Death had no more uh, dominion over me. You see, that's what the early church experienced. Death had no dom more dominion over them because they knew that when they laid this body down, they entered into the plan of God for eternity, never to die again. You see, Paul even went as far as to say, it would be gain for me to die, but for your sake, I live. You see, it'd be gain for those that are born into Christ. It'd be gain for them to go on to be with the Lord and graduate out of this temporal place of time into the into the eternal realm that dies that never dies that is always moving is always on in the presence of God. Verse ten says, "For in the in that he died, he died unto sin once. He's not going to die for your sins over and over again. He died for all sin one time." Does that mean that once I commit myself to Jesus Christ and, and, and he, he died for my sins that I committed past, it goes further than that. It means that he died for my past, present, and future sins at one time. And you see, I have faith that God has called me out of that of that. Uh, of that carnal nature of God that I might walk in newness and in power of my desires and my belief and faith in him. You see, the greatest story, the greatest story in the Bible is that Abraham believed God. You see, the, why it's the greatest story is because Abraham believed God. He didn't have a Bible to go by. He didn't have this 10-step program here and there. He believed God because God spoke to him and he heard him and he came out. Praise God. Hallelujah. That's the greatest I mean, example there is of someone that, that, that hasn't picked up the Bible can, can believe God because God is. You see, if, if you understand history, then you know that God tells in advance the things that are going to happen. And he does that for one purpose, that we might believe. If he didn't tell us, he might, we might think that the idol that we created did what we needed it to happen. But no, he told us in advance. And it happened, and it's happening still. Amen? Did I read verse all of verse ten? For in the in that he died, he died once he he died unto sin once, but in that he liveth, he live unto God. So what does that tell us here in, in Romans chapter six? It tells us that that once we crucify this flesh man, that we ought to live unto God. Not unto ourselves, not unto a fallen world, but that we ought to live unto God and do the works of God. The works of God is the testimony that Jesus died for the sins of the world and he rose again on the third day that every 
everybody, not just somebody, that everybody should have life eternal and be pulled out of time into eternity, the eighth day, the new beginning. And, and so we worship God on the Sabbath day. And Paul says, don't let anybody con, uh, contend for you over the day that, that you worship God because all days belong to God. Amen. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. The altar of creation is where God began. And so the altar of creation, just as two, two, God reacts unto God reaches, you see, in the creation in Genesis 2, God reached into Adam and pulled out a great prize. Amen. Huh? Yes. I mean, God reached into Adam after he put a, a deep sleep, it says, in, in Genesis chapter 2, verse uh, 21 22. Uh, verse 21 and 22 says, Adam, a deep sleep, a deep sleep. You know, when Lazarus was dead, Jesus told the disciples he sleeps. You see, God created, brought Adam to a deep sleep because God was going to pull out of Adam a great prize. So when, when the only begotten son hung on the cross and the sun got dark and, and God turned his back and, and the soldier put a spear up in his side. Then God pulled out of, uh, out of Jesus the great prize that he had a foreshadow of in Genesis chapter 2. That great prize was the church, the bride of Christ. Hallelujah. Do you feel uh, renewed now? I mean, are you confessing Jesus Christ your Savior? Do you believe God like Abraham believed God? Because if you believe God like Abraham believed God, it would be counted to you for righteousness. Now, I was talking about in, in, in the book of Daniel. Let's see. Let me read this. The altar of creation, Genesis 2, God reached into Adam and took out uh, the treasure of creation. See, the treasure of creation is a house for God. Bereshit means house. Bereshit is the first word in the, in the, in the book of Genesis. Bereshit means house. The next step was to bring the treasure. The next step in Genesis chapter 2, verse 21 and 22, is to bring the treasure, the woman, back to the created man that God, man, and the bride would become one. So the God, man, and the bride would become one, the church. So that relationship, the family of God, is one when we walk out what God foretold his plan was. His plan was to have a, 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 a family that he took out of himself and so that that family that he that he took out of himself is what Paul's talking about here in Genesis chapter 6 in Genesis chapter I mean not Genesis chapter 6 Romans chapter 6 he's talking about the new man because the old man's dead and the new man becomes the treasure of God that he pulled out that he foretold about in Genesis 2 and all through the Bible I mean, if you look at the scripture, you, you understand that Jacob came along and, and, you know, Jacob labored for Rachel for seven years, but he got Leah. All right, Leah is a type of the church, uh, and Leah had seven children. She had six sons and one daughter. And so uh, it's a type of Revelation chapter 2, verse 2, or chapter 2 and chapter 3, the seven churches. It's a type of that. But you see, God has another treasure. That treasure that, that is the, the great price is the Jews. You see, because God's plan played out and God had to choose a people that eventually, after they, after they were called out and walked with God, uh, after they were called out and rebelled on God, that he would bring them to a place. He would bring them to a place that, that on the... On the on the uh, 400 and 
483rd year after Israel was sent back from Babylon, 483 years later, Jesus would ride into Jerusalem on a donkey. And then the next day or two, the Jews, the priesthood, the, Gen the Levite uh, uh, keepers of the law would shout out to Pilate, crucify him. Crucify him. Huh? Yeah. So they were part of the plan. But you see, they're going to have a great reward for being part of the plan. But you see, we don't see the plan unless we know history. Now, I want to, I want to uh, take you to 2 Timothy chapter 2. But before we go to 2 Timothy chapter 2, Carl, put that little video on. I want to show you that, you know, I said that Daniel's a very important aspect of history. You know, the, 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 uh, the, the students of, of uh, history, they declared, and they still, there's still an argument about when Daniel was written or whether the Daniel of the captivity is the same Daniel that wrote the book of Daniel, but we know it is because God I mean, Daniel, God told Daniel in foreknowledge of the things that were going to happen. You see, Daniel was from 605 B.C. The, the captivity ended in 536 B.C., which was the end of the 70 year. And we know that Daniel was still alive then because Daniel uh, read in Jeremiah that the captivity would be 70 years. And he started proclaiming that, that the captivity was completed. And then Cyrus, you see, Jeremiah had foretold it even before Jeremiah because in, in Isaiah 45 it says, and this is 150 years before the event happened. In Isaiah 45, it said that there'd been a man named Cyrus come on the scene, and Cyrus would sign a decree to send the Jews back before they ever were in captivity. Why is these things prepared for us that we might believe? This is not some story done in the corner. This is not some alien event or things that happen in, in the past that have no bearing on our future. I mean, everybody's scared of the book of Revelation, but the book of Revelation is the only book that, that provides a promise, a, a blessing to those that read and study it. But I, I found this guy a long time ago, and, and this guy that I want to show you right here, uh, his name's Brett. I don't know his last name, but his first name's Brett. And, and so for several years now, he's been teaching his church Bible history. And how he's been teaching his church history is through the Bible. So he is taught, and, and I, I want to show you this, he taught this back in, in 2021, and he's going through the book of Daniel and, and how precise it was. Susan and Brian and I went to the Asian buffet yesterday, and I told her, I said, you know, if the Bible can tell you that, that uh, Elizabeth Taylor and, and Richard Burton is in Daniel, then, I mean, i got to believe it. Huh? Huh? <laughs> I mean, isn't that what I told you? I mean, and Susan, what? <laughs> Elizabeth Taylor and Richard Burton's in the book of Daniel, chapter 11? Huh? What, what fruitcake you been eating on? Huh? I mean, to, 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 to just say that right there, you're thinking, well, that, that guy's crazy. I mean, where did he get did he get off on the fruit loops or something this morning? Huh? Now the, just just chapter eleven. You see, the book of Daniel, uh, you see, the book of Daniel is not linear. Uh, the book of Daniel up to chapter five is is um, in events, but after chapter five, then it goes back to Chapter 5 goes back into, into where uh, Daniel chapter 3 is. You see, in chapter 3, the church is not mentioned, but neither is Daniel. 
Daniel's not mentioned in Daniel's name is not mentioned in in Daniel chapter three. What does Daniel chapter three cover? Daniel chapter three covers the three Hebrew children that wouldn't bow down to the image that Nebuchadnezzar set up. Huh? So where was Daniel? Well, students of the Bible think that that's a picture of the rapture. That Daniel's a picture of the rapture. And the three Hebrew children are a picture of tribulation saints or the Jews that will be saved at the end of the tribulation. Get it? Okay, that's, that's Daniel chapter 3. And he goes through all these things. And pull that up, Carl. Uh, now, this is about an hour or something long. It's an hour and, 22, hour and two minutes long. This uh, is Brett. He pastors a church in Portland, Oregon. Or we go there. <laughs> it's a long ways. But you see, he's a history buff. And he's a Bible history buff. And I want you to just see right here where, where, Cle where Cleopatra plays in the story of Daniel chapter 11. Because Daniel, the, the angel that talks to Daniel, is giving him a history lesson, not in the past things that's happened, a history lesson in the future things that's going to happen before Christ. So these things that he's talking about in Daniel chapter 11 played out in history. From, from 536 B.C. to 36 B.C. These things in chapter 11 played out. P play, play it right there, Carl. Hit play. Sends his daughter down. Uh, in this, okay. the old, let's send my daughter down to the Ptolemies again and see how that works out. This is the second round of that. So he sends his daughter. Anybody know the daughter's name? Cleopatra. <laughs> um, she's sent down. Uh -huh. this now, is, she's in the Bible. Stop That's it right there. Elizabeth this is a second. Taylor's in the Bible. Anyway. Stop it right no. there. This is a second. Okay. So he's he's telling a history lesson, but he's using scripture that that the, the angel of the Lord told Daniel in advance. And he wrote down. So he's talking about the. The, the Solution Empire and the Tanomi Empire, which the, after Alexander the Great, the kingdom of the world were divided into four parts. The Solution Empire took over the area of, uh, of Syria down to Israel. The Tanomi Empire took over from Egypt up to Israel, so Israel became a stumbling block to both of them. Okay, so here you got this, the 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 uh, Antiphanes, Epiphanes, uh, Antiphanes. You have uh, a solution, general solution had children, and so they were named uh, Ptolemy, or not Ptolemy, but uh, Antichamus, Antichamus. And so you had Antichamus one. Atticamus 2, and then you had the Atticamus 3 that, that uh, killed the priest and, and because he wouldn't drink pig's blood on the steps of the altar. And this is history. So that's where we're at. And so uh, he's, he's telling that this, this story was with Cleopatra is written in there about verse 17, I think it is, of chapter 11, when it talks about a queen. And that queen was the daughter of, of Antiphany. Antiphany. Go ahead and play it again. No, just, you, anybody old enough to see the Richard Burton, Elizabeth Taylor movie? Yeah. Um, if, uh, if you want to watch the movie, it's kind of telling verse 17 and 18. Um, but that actually happened. Uh, and Cleopatra sent down. Now, it's a crazy story because um, it says here that she would be called the daughter of women corrupting her. Um, she's sent down there to marry this kid. Um, she's and, sent uh, down and, to the you know, everybody's Tanomi kind of thinking, Empire to marry this by the kid, way, this um, child Antiochus of the king. Antiochus sends her the, down there with there. the intention of not Cleopatra really having her find romance and being married and loving, and living down there. She, sent, she was sent down there to be a spy. They basically said, tell us, 
Get us information about what's going on down there so that we can defeat our enemies. Well, she goes down there and lo and behold, this kid sort of grows up and she falls in love with him. And uh, she ends up, you know, uh, staying on their side. And that's exactly what the Bible says. They, um, they would uh, corrupt her, but she would not stand on his side, you know, her father's side, neither before him. Now, um, so what happens? Um, when Antiochus gives Cleopatra and then realizes his daughter's not gonna stand on his side, he freaks out and he's really upset. So he turns his attention to the isles that I just told you about, Cilicia, Lycia, and Caria. Um, and uh, he goes and says, I, if I can't do that, then I'm gonna take on these isles and just take them from the Egyptian area or people, the Ptolemies. Well, he bumps into the Romans and he fails and he's defeated there. And so basically this, this whole arranged marriage thing bombs out again. The groom was 10 years old, by the way, and they consummated their marriage. That's why it's kind of a corruption that's talked about here. Um, along with um, uh, Kole, Syria, Phoenicia, and Judea as a dowry. They, got, they, they not only got Cleopatra, but all these places, including parts of Judea, the Jews, as a dowry and in hopes that he could actually annex Egypt. So there's, this is all, the reason I'm going into these, all these details are kind of in here in sort of a cryptic sort of way. I mean, some of it you can kind of figure out, but a lot of it's going, wow, what are we talking about? This woman who's the daughter of women and corrupted and all this stuff. It's, when you see the history lined up, um, you know, basically you, you see it perfectly unfold as the Bible says. So when it says, um, she, but she shall not stand on his side, she became devoted wife and, and sided with Egypt uh, and her new ally, Rome, Cleopatra, uh, sort of signed on with, with the Romans and that's where Richard Burton comes in and all that stuff. Well, anyway, so in 196 BC, Antiochus, um, you know, goes and turns BC his anger just, uh, to, um, you know, to these islands, but also but see, one, uh, he fights more of the Romans and the Bible talks about that, that a little bit as well, time, um, where, you know, God, his army starts the, to the suffer huge to defeats told Daniel and he's losing write all kinds down. of power. Europe and Asia so Minor, he had to surrender all the territory of the west and that's of the Taurus Mountain they say it's and so pay accurate. huge okay, money uh, 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 in his ruin. This, like, he's starting this, to become Carl, very ruined. And then he ends up dying. Let's take a look. So you can, why it's written down here is to show us that the word of God is so accurate. And it's to the point and, and that, that it would be a fool. I mean, it would be a fool to not believe Jesus Christ, that, that he died and rose again, and that he did it all for me and you. And so we'd be a fool to not embrace that. I mean, uh, Abraham, long time ago, long time ago, heard God and believed God and it was counted to him for righteousness because he believed God. And we have so much history. I mean, that's what, that's what uh, Acts chapter 15 verse 18 is talking about. I mean, and, and if anybody knew history, if anybody knew the story of the Jews, Paul knew it. Because Paul said to feed a Gamaliel, a teacher of history and God's story with the Jews all the way to Christ and his resurrection. And Paul didn't understand the story in the beginning till he had an encounter with Christ on the road to Damascus. I had an encounter with Jesus Christ. 35 years ago and it changed my mind about who I was and because God changed my mind about who I was I quit being who I was before and there's nothing to go back to there's nothing to look back to it's all before me. It's all before me because I died 35 years ago and I've been being made brand new 
for 35 years. And God's not through with me yet. God's not through with me yet. He's not through with you yet. You see, we, we don't walk in the ability that we could walk in if we would just completely give ourselves over to the will of God in Christ Jesus. We would see souls saved if we really act like we were saved. We would see people's lives changed because they would see a supernatural relationship with the God of all creation. Because, and, and we have evidence through his story, through history, through all the things that have happened in the past to bring us to the future. You see, the Bible says that the callings of God, this is important. The Bible says that the callings of God are without repentance. You can't repent of what God calls you to do. People think they can. Like I said before, Jonah thought he could. He's one side. He wanted to be a he wanted to be a prophet. Well, he didn't like what God told him to do. Go to Nineveh, Nineveh in seven twenty two B C attacked the, the the ten northern tribes of Israel and scattered them all over the world, and they become the lost tribes of Israel. He didn't like them people. Before the, before the Babylonian Empire, Nebuchadnezzar, the, the king pin on the world scene was the Assyrians. That it was Their capital was Nineveh. Amen. That's true. Huh? Amen. The story's greater than the Jews. The story's greater than the Jews because the treasure that God's reaching into his word to pull out listen to me the treasure we talked about that God pulled out of Adam was Eve and then God brought Eve to Adam the treasure that God's pulling out of his word is the church the pearl of great price Huh? The treasure that when he found it, he went and sold everything that he had to buy the field. Yes. <clears throat> Come on, this is, I mean, maybe, maybe if, maybe it's took me a little too long to get here. I don't know. I've lost people's attention in, in, in trying to lay out the story. But you see, that's part of the plan too because it's a sacrifice. I mean, you have to be willing to sacrifice your will to his will. So if you're willing to sacrifice his will, then that means you're willing to do whatever it takes to get it. Huh? And you see, it's, uh, it's the greatest treasure it's the greatest treasure that, that was ever planned. And God himself planned it. And he wrote about it in his book. And the devil would have you to just lay his book on the shelf. Oh, it takes time. I don't have the ability to read real good, so... It's been it's been more difficult for me than it might be for somebody that can read and comprehend what they read. So so but you see, I I came to a place that I had to have it because I, what I had wasn't was death. I got, I come to a place that I had I had to have what God intended me to have. The devil's trying to throw every obstacle 
in in my way to keep me from getting it, to keep you from getting it. You see, there there's a cost. You see, the reward of fruit, the reward of being fruitful is pruning. Huh? And it hurts to be pruned. I mean, you can think, well, I've been really fruitful. My fruit's been really good over this past year. He said, yeah, your fruit's been really good over this past year. Let me cut this away from you. Let me cut that limb off. Let me pull this bloom off your tree. Huh? Let's stand. Abraham is the greatest example that we ever had because he didn't have the word of God to lean back on. Thank you, God. We saw some history here through the book of Daniel and a great teacher. I would recommend him to anyone. Uh, he's, a, he's a pastor in Portland, Oregon, and the name of his church is A.C. Creek Baptist Church. A.C. Creek Baptist Church. If you want to go on an adventure through the Bible, go back and listen to his historical layout over all the Bible through history. And, and he's one of the best I ever heard of, I've ever listened to. I used to promote David Paulson. David Paulson passed away. He was 87, I think, and he's an English guy. And he went through the Bible much in the way that this Brett, Brett does. But you see, David Paulson, I listened to all his stuff, and, and and he was not a pre-trib rapture person, which Brett is a pre-trib rapture person and teaches that too, and that's what I believe. I believe that the bride is going to be adorned and going to be dragging her rear end through the gate, all beat up and ragged through. Huh? The bride ain't going. He's not coming after a bride that looks like that. He's a bride. He's coming after a bride that's put on the bridal garments that the father provided. Huh? You know what the bridal garment is? Jesus Christ. Put on Jesus. Put on Jesus every day. Don't wait. In the Jewish wedding, the bride, the, the groom goes and prepares a place added onto his father's house. If you go to Israel now or if you go to Syria now, you see great houses built, but they'll always have rebar sticking out of them for the sons to build on to for their brides. Still today. Still today. And so, yes. He's going to prepare a place in John 14. The father's going to say, go get the bride. Right there's the picture. And so our job is to be ready with the wedding garment on that the father provided 2,000 years ago, not on the cross, in the resurrection garment, the glorified body. Walk in newness. Don't walk as the old man would walk because the old man would never know God. And the most important thing is once you've received the callings of God and God's always calling or without repentance. You can't repent of God's story or you'll find yourself like Jonah not having a will, but having an option. Not having a will, but having an option. The option is do it God's way or no way. Not my intervention woven through it. It's his way. And he gives it to us in advance. And that's how we know that it's true. That's how we know that it's sure. That's how you know that you can take it to the bank. You might say. May not be what you looked, what it looked like you thought it was going to look like, 
but it's his will because you have to remember that to bear fruit, you have to be pruned. Come on. Rejoice in your pruning. Huh? Pruning makes you healthy. You know, I, I don't know there's nowhere to close this because it's a never-ending story. There's nowhere to close this. I'm, I'm just going to ask the Lord. I'm going to ask the Lord to continue to keep the ears of those that would hear the message open. Okay? I'm going to ask the Lord to keep the ears of those that would hear open. Father, we just thank you for this opportunity. I know we're long-winded. I, I ask you to forgive me. I pray that you'd minister to everyone here according to the, your riches and glory for them. Lord, help us walk out your plan that we might have much fruit to present to you, not to present to ourselves, but to present to you because you're the way, you're the truth, and you're the life. And Lord, no man or woman comes to you except by, by Jesus Christ, our Savior. Lord, we pray that your will be done in our lives. Help us to draw people. Help us to invite people. Help us to be encouraged throughout our week to know you and the power of your resurrection. And if that happens to us, we will come in next Sunday rejoicing. Rejoicing. Like the disciples that came back rejoicing because they saw great things just by the power of your name. Now that's what we have faith in is the power of your name and your story. We give you the glory for all of it because we ask it in Jesus' name. Let it be so. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Woo. Thank you. Thank you, Lord.